Hi, it's Katrina. Greedy Gold. In 2015, a pair of metal detectorists named George Powell and Leighton Davies found an array of jewelry dating back between the 5th and 9th centuries, as well as around 300 Anglo-Saxon coins. Altogether, the hoard is believed to be worth up to 12 million pounds. Just one little problem, though. They found it on private land and did not have permission from the property's owner, Lord Colley, so they were in some hot water. The duo kept quiet about their discovery, a direct violation of the Treasure Act, which requires people to declare potentially valuable fines. Items deemed to be treasure automatically become crown property, and the finders often receive a reward. Laws like this are meant to keep valuable artifacts and treasures out of private hands, so that the public can enjoy them at museums and researchers can learn from them. Authorities learned of the hoard after Powell and Davies tried to covertly sell some of the coins to private dealers. They arrested the pair, who received lengthy prison sentences, ranging from eight and a half to ten years. At their sentencing, the judge condemned the men for robbing society of the opportunity to see and admire the artifacts and of cheating the landowner out of his deserved reward. All the jewelry from the hoard and one ingot were recovered, but only 30 of the 300 coins were found. The government is still trying to find the rest of the missing coins. The SS America Hoard Back in 1857, the steamship SS Central America, nicknamed the Ship of Gold, sank in a hurricane off the South Carolina coast while en route from Panama to New York City, taking thousands of pounds of gold and 425 human lives down with it. During the 1980s, treasure hunter Tommy Thompson convinced 161 investors to fund his expedition to find the shipwreck and its treasure. They ended up giving him $12.7 million for the search. Thompson and his crew discovered the wreck 8,000 feet below the water's surface in 1988. The following year, they reportedly recovered around three tons of gold worth over $50 million. They were awarded 92% ownership of the loot a decade later following a slew of lawsuits, which continued to come in the following years from companies and experts who claimed that Thompson cheated them out of millions of dollars by never awarding them their share. In 2012, Thompson failed to appear at a court hearing and went into hiding. He and his girlfriend were found in a hotel room in Palm Beach County, Florida three years later, where the couple kept a low profile, rarely leaving the building and paying for everything in cash. Thompson has spent the last five years in federal prison, incurring a $1,000 per day fine for refusing to disclose the location of some of the missing treasure, which is worth an estimated two to four million dollars. He's being held in contempt of court, which normally has an 18-month holding limit, and it's unknown how long the man will languish behind bars if he continues refusing to reveal where the treasure is. Thompson conveniently claims he doesn't know where the gold coins are, and he even has some supporters who claim that he never cheated anyone out of money. But the judge refuses to buy any of it and continues to demand answers. Whether or not Thompson will eventually crack remains to be seen. Royal Hatpin while searching a field in Lincolnshire, England in early 2019, amateur metal detectorist Lisa Grace hit pay dirt in the form of a gold hatpin that may have belonged to King Edward IV. The 15th century piece, which Grace found in pristine condition, bears a striking resemblance to the pins that Edward and those close to him wore throughout his two reigns, which spanned from 1460 until his death in 1483. It bears the king's personal emblem depicting a sun in splendor, and also features a purple amethyst stone, which he was known to favor, leading experts to wonder if Edward IV himself lost the hat pin. This is plausible, especially since the artifact resembles a similar piece of jewelry featured in a portrait of the ruler. But, as a Duke's auctioneer spokesperson stated to the Daily Mail regarding the owner's identity, the fact is we shall never know, but it clearly belonged to someone of high status in the upper echelons of medieval society. Specialists believe that the hat pin was likely made during the late 15th century, and that it may have been lost in battle, owing to the frequent conflicts that the monarch found himself in during his first reign, many of which occurred in the area where Grace found the artifact. They estimated its value at somewhere between 10,000 to 15,000 pounds, adding that museums and collectors showed immediate interest in it. Miss Grace, who found the piece near the ground surface, was unaware of its significance until she contacted friends about it, and she was shocked when she learned it may have belonged to royalty. Talk about beginner's luck. An Exiled Queen Story while cleaning out his attic before moving, a man in Guildford, Surrey, England, found an array of historic items that he had forgotten were there. 
His mother had given him a bunch of stuff, and unaware of its value, he put it in the attic for years, where the objects sat collecting dust. The collection includes an elegant 19th century dress, a needle case, letters, diaries, photographs, and postcards, which belong to the man's aunt, Clara Herbert. Herbert worked for the Madagascan royal family for many years, from the 1890s until the 1920s. The items found in the attic offer fascinating insight into the life of Rana Valona, Madagascar's last queen before the French invaded the country and took over in 1895. The earlier photos show Rana Valona on her throne and donning beautiful, intricately made dresses. But the images also tell the story of what happened to the royal family after the French annexed Madagascar and exiled them to the island of Réunion. Pictures from that time show the queen and her family in a seemingly miserable state, and they are noticeably thin, auctioneer Carrie Taylor told The Guardian. Rana Valona and her loved ones were then sent to Algiers, where their lives seem to have improved, as evidenced by photos of them looking happier and healthier. After that, they visited France, where the family gained ample support from the country's citizens, in turn pressuring the French government to compensate them more fairly for their suffering over the years. Rana Valona passed away in 1917. The pink and purple satin and velvet dress belonged to Rana Valona's aunt, Ramesini Drazana, and is a rare example of 19th century high fashion that was worn by a black woman, according to Taylor. The goods had an estimated value of anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, but sold for nearly 48,000 pounds. A Bird Watcher's Bounty While bird watching next to a farmer's field in the English countryside last September, an amateur metal detectorist discovered a 2,000-year-old trove of around 1,300 Celtic coins, dating back to sometime between 40 and 50 AD. The funny thing is that the unnamed bird watcher was watching a buzzard and some magpies and saw a glint of gold. It was a coin, and then nearby was another. He rushed home to get his metal detector and forgot the birds. The metal detector gave off a strong signal at the site, and the treasure hunter dug out a copper vessel brimming with gold coins. These date back to when the ancient Celtic queen Bodica led a massive uprising against the Romans. Worth an estimated $1,150,000, it's the largest Iron Age coin hoard found in the country since 2008. It is possible that the coins may form a deposit as a war chest for Bodega's eastern campaigns, treasure hunting editor Jules Evan Hart said in a statement. When the man realized what he had found, he said in an interview that he was shocked and had to sit down. He took the coins home and contacted local authorities to report the find, a requirement under British law. The next step is for experts to determine whether the stash legally qualifies as treasure, which plays a role in determining its ownership. If the coins are deemed to be a significant treasure, they will likely go to a museum, and the finder is also rewarded. Bodica was an ancient warrior queen of the Iceni, who led a revolt against the Romans after they killed her husband, beat her publicly, and violated her daughters. Completely enraged, she led a rebellion against the Romans. Her forces killed as many as 70,000 Romans and Roman supporters, and for a while was a terror to the empire. During this volatile time, there was an increase in buried coins throughout the region. But Bodica's army was eventually defeated, and she thereafter either poisoned herself to death or succumbed to an illness. A Mysterious Glimmer of Hope while walking from the latrine to his hut on the Caribbean shore one morning in late 2019, a young Venezuelan fisherman named Yolman Lares found a medallion bearing the Virgin Mary's image on the ground. The discovery came as a rare sign of hope for the 25-year-old and for many others who live in the struggling village of Guaca, which is in dire poverty amid Venezuela's ongoing extreme economic downfall. Journalists recently recounted the details of Lares' fascinating find in a New York Times article. The discovery sparked a frenzied treasure hunt among residents, which turned up hundreds of gold and silver pieces over the next few months, including jewelry, ornaments, and gold nuggets. A test of one piece, courtesy of the New York Times, determined that the item is modern and was likely made in Europe, and that it's made of high-quality 18-karat gold. The origin of the items is a complete mystery, with some residents considering the discoveries a blessing, while others regard them as a curse. Theories abound, including speculation that government officials planted the goods to placate the impoverished local residents, who have become increasingly frustrated with the deteriorating economic conditions in recent years. Some believe that the treasure somehow got lost and washed ashore while being smuggled. Most of the objects were sold right away for food, other necessities, and simple lifestyle upgrades, like used televisions. To the destitute residents of Guaca, survival was understandably more important than determining the source of their finds. 
While experts admit that they may never know where the treasure came from, its ability to feed a struggling population is infinitely more important. Fen Treasure In 2010, an eccentric millionaire named Forrest Fenn hid a chest filled with $1 million worth of treasure in the Rocky Mountains. He published a series of clues to its whereabouts, along with a finder's keepers policy on the goods. The chest contained gold nuggets, precious gems, rare coins, and jewelry. Thousands of people searched for the treasure over the following decade, including five unfortunate souls who died in their quest to find it. Finally, in June 2020, Fenn announced that someone had found the chest, much to the disappointment of many who hoped to hit the jackpot. I told you about this in a previous video, but now new information has come to light. The discoverer's identity remained anonymous for several months, until a lawsuit against him from someone who claimed that the treasure is rightfully theirs threatened to disclose his name. He came forward on his own in late 2020 in a Medium post, revealing himself as a medical student from Michigan named Jack Stoof. After finding the treasure in Wyoming and revealing his identity, Jake's life changed dramatically. He felt the need to move to a more secure apartment building and take other measures to protect his safety as a slew of upset treasure hunters levied death threats, tried to delegitimize the discovery, and made bizarre and disturbing allegations against him. Treasure hunting does not make you a lot of friends, and apparently there's a lot of competition. Too bad he couldn't remain anonymous. He sure did try. A Princess's Precious Metals when archaeologist Dr. Adam Kadzierski visited the small village of Slaskov in central Poland last year, the local priest relayed tales he had heard about buried treasure nearby. After initially investigating a lead that turned out to be false, Kadzierski and his team dug at a roadside location that the father had suggested checking out. Two days later, they found a pot containing 6,500 silver coins called denarii, as well as silver ingots, lead fragments, two wedding bands, and two gold rings. When the archaeologists realized they'd stumbled upon a massive treasure hoard, they summoned local firemen to guard the scene. The treasures are around 900 years old, dating back to the 11th and 12th centuries. One ring bears acrylic inscription that translates to, Lord, may you help your servant Maria, leading Kedzierski to believe that it may have belonged to a Ruthenian princess named Maria. This makes sense since the king at the time, Boleslav the Rymouth, was married to a Russian princess whose sister was named Maria. Furthermore, Kedzierski believes that Maria may have buried the coins after receiving them as a dowry for her marriage to a nobleman. At a time when tensions mounted between her husband and his family, resulting in him being kidnapped and tortured, perhaps Maria felt the need to protect their valuables before she fled Poland. And while this theory remains unconfirmed, all signs point toward it likely being the case. Sutton Hoo Ship Burial a new Netflix film called The Dig retells the discovery of one of the greatest treasure troves of all time, known as the Sutton Hoo Ship Burial. Let me know if you've seen it! Amateur archaeologist Basil Brown discovered the 88.6-foot-long buried ship in 1939. The ship is the most impressive medieval grave to be discovered in Europe, filled to the brim with treasures. It contains countless objects made by master craftsmen, including military weapons, elegant textiles, a large wooden shield, containers, bowls, Byzantine silverware, a rare helmet with a human mask, gold accessories, and more. These items came from all over the known world at the time, symbolizing the far-reaching international relations of the society responsible for the burial. The Sutton Hoo helmet is arguably the most iconic of all the grave goods. At some point, the burial chamber collapsed, breaking it into hundreds of pieces. Conservationists from the British Museum spent years working painstakingly to restore the iron helmet, which is covered in warriors and a winged dragon. Whoever was buried here was clearly important to the Anglo-Saxons, but who was it? The remains of the grave occupant were missing from the burial. A soil analysis shows that the grave once contained human remains, which completely decomposed and dissolved at some point. This high-ranking person's identity is a mystery, but based on 8th century texts and the burial's valuable contents, experts believe that the grave was for the powerful East Anglian ruler King Raedwald. King Raedwald died around 624 AD, and coins found in his burial from around that time bolster the theory that the grave is his. But researchers admittedly don't know for sure who was laid to rest in the ship, and since the remains no longer exist, they will never know for sure. Babirusa Teeth Babirusas, also called deer pigs, are found exclusively on the Indonesian islands of Sulawesi, Togian, Sula, and Buru. The most well-known among them is the North Sulawesi species, which is famous for the upward-curving tusks that males have, 
which pierce their snout and curve back toward their forehead. It's long been rumored that these overgrown canines can become long enough to pierce the animal's skull and kill them. The truthfulness of this claim was highly doubted for a long time, but in 2010, Darren Nash of Tetrapod Zoology pointed out that there is at least one known example of this happening. A reader named Henrik Peterson brought to Nash's attention a babirusa skull at the Museum of Natural History in Gothenburg, Sweden, that has a right tusk penetrating the skull. These extraordinarily rare instances probably only happen among very old babirusas. In a 2018 study, scientists identified more examples than they expected to find of tusks eroding the animal's frontal bones. They concluded that 12% of wild babirusas experience this and other tooth abnormalities that erode parts of the cranium. The team also determined that in some cases, the fragility of the babirusas' tusks spares some of these animals from incurring such damage in the wild. Veterinarians trim the tusks on captive specimens so they avoid these problems altogether. In any case, with everything that animals have to do to survive, it seems unfair to be impaled by your own tusk. Short snouts. Flat-faced dogs, including pugs, bulldogs, French bulldogs, and shih tzus, have become increasingly popular in recent years. These breeds were deliberately bred to have certain cute features, like short limbs, big eyes, and a small mouth and jaw. But these characteristics make them prone to a host of health issues. Overlapping teeth lead to a higher risk of decay and gum disease. Heavy skin folds on the face can cause a condition known as cherry eye, as well as eye ulcers, which sometimes requires the eye to be removed. Flat-faced canines often endure difficulty eating and swallowing as well. They always seem to be out of breath and snort and sneeze all the time. Many of these dogs require cesarean sections due to the puppy's heads being too large for the birth canal. An overwhelming number of English and French bulldogs and Boston Terriers are delivered by C-section, and giving birth without human assistance would result in an excruciatingly painful death. Flat-faced breeds, particularly Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, are also prone to painful neurological problems resulting from their compressed skulls. The dog's shortened and narrow airways often result in a constant inadequate oxygen supply, leading to breathing and secondary heart problems. Brachycephalus syndrome is an alarmingly common ailment among flat-faced breeds. Caring for one of these pups can be very expensive, and they tend to live shorter lives than other types of dogs. Animal activists and veterinarians have criticized profit-driven breeders for knowingly breeding dogs that are highly likely to suffer from health problems. Some organizations and experts, including the British Veterinary Association, have encouraged the public not to purchase these designer breeds, which are often very expensive. However, a 2020 study on breed loyalty to flat-faced dogs found that people enjoy them for more than just their looks, with many citing their beloved canine companion's personality traits as a reason that they would get the same kind of dog again in the future. These dogs are amazingly affectionate and just overall great friends. While those who love flat-faced dogs adamantly defend their choice to own them, there is a growing consensus in the veterinary and animal welfare communities that we have a responsibility to breed healthy dogs too. Sheep's Wool In 2015, an Australian citizen found a sheep with massively overgrown wool outside Canberra, the country's capital. The ship, nicknamed Chris, was so weighed down by his 18-inch coat that he could barely walk. If he had gone on much longer without being discovered, he probably would have died. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, or the RSPCA, contacted national shearing champion Ian Elkins, who sheared Chris. The sheep had to be sedated for the procedure, which took over 40 minutes. Altogether, shearers removed 89 pounds of fleece, six years' worth, superseding the previous world record for the largest single fleece ever shorn by nearly 30 pounds. The wool is on display at the National Museum of Australia. This unfortunate incident served as a reminder that merino sheep can suffer from serious medical problems and have trouble when it comes to performing simple tasks, like going to the bathroom, if they are not shorn regularly. These domesticated animals depend on people to take care of them. Chris regained his health and spent his final years at the Little Oak Sanctuary in New South Wales before passing away from old age in October 2019. His caretakers described him as a sweet, wise, friendly soul in a post mourning his death. Deer Antlers Late last year, Kansas Wildlife Parks and Tourism Game Wardens posted an image on their Facebook page of two dead deer with interlocked antlers. A Rice County resident had found the pair who apparently got stuck together while sparring. 
This is known to occasionally happen. It's far less common, but not completely unheard of for more than two deer to be found with their antlers entwined. In November 2010, a forester in Ohio discovered three dead submerged bucks attached together by the antlers. It appeared as though two of the bucks were already fighting when the third joined in, resulting in the tangled mess that led them into the water as they struggled amongst each other and ultimately drowned. When deer are discovered still alive with their antlers stuck together, life-saving efforts are often made to separate them. In some cases, rescuers have used chainsaws to free deer from each other. Earlier this year, Kansas game wardens responded to a call from a bow hunter about a pair of bucks who were joined at the antlers. The deer were still struggling and weren't very tired yet, so it was still too dangerous dangerous to approach them. Video footage of the rescue shows game warden Jeff Klauser using his gun to shoot one of the antlers, successfully freeing the deer. Horse Hooves Hooves grow continuously, much like fingernails. Horses who live in the wild naturally keep their hooves short by roaming long distances. Domestic horses, on the other hand, need their hooves trimmed regularly to prevent them from getting too long. Overgrown hooves force horses to distribute their weight unnaturally, more or less by walking on the balls of their feet. This stresses the tendons and can lead to lameness and other serious Serious, potentially life-threatening problems. The extent of the damage that overgrown hooves can cause made headlines in 2015, when the Maryland-based Days End Farm Horse Rescue took two neglected stallions into its care. Rescuers found them emaciated, surrounded by their own waist and unable to move, with three-foot-long hooves. Although the pair were in critical condition, they were luckier than a mare who was euthanized at the property because her overgrown hooves caused a condition called fetlock dislocation. Her case was so severe she couldn't be saved. The veterinarian and farrier had to sedate the surviving two horses and remove portions of their hooves on scene in order to transport them safely to the rescue. It was reportedly the worst case of hoof neglect that the organization had ever seen. Miraculously, the horses, named Quest and Rio, fully recovered and were both adopted into loving homes where they will never suffer in neglectful conditions again. Tortoise Shell when a tortoise gets stuck on its back, it is entirely possible that the animal will die if it doesn't get help. Those with more curved shells have a better chance at riding themselves on their own than tortoises with flatter shells, and smaller tortoises also have an advantage, since flipping back over requires less energy. A 2015 study delved deeper into the predicament to learn more about which tortoises are more advantaged than others when it comes to getting back on their feet. The research showed that large tortoises, particularly males, are disproportionately affected by this problem. When males fight each other, they attempt to flip their opponent onto their back, knowing this will snag them an easy victory. While larger tortoises are more likely to win, they are also more likely to become stranded if they land on their backs. Tortoises become stranded for other reasons, including illness, injury, climbing accidents, and bad habits. In the wild, too much time spent on its back subjects one to predators, the elements, and starvation. In the sun, they are especially prone to deadly overheating. When a tortoise lands in this unnatural and vulnerable position, they spend precious energy panicking. Sometimes their flailing is enough to get them back upright, and sometimes it's not. Argali Horn Native to the highlands of Central Asia, the Argali is the largest living wild sheep, with full-grown males standing around four feet tall at the shoulder and weighing over 300 pounds. Both males and females have horns, which are larger among rams. The Pamir Argali, nicknamed the Marco Polo sheep, has the longest horns of them all, measuring up to six feet long. On the other hand, the Siberian Argali has shorter but more noticeably massive horns. Argali horns develop rings each year which can help determine the animal's age. They use these horns to stay cool, defend themselves, and to fight each other for dominance. These enormous horns can cause severe injury but make quite the powerful statement. But just like with some other animals, these horns can grow improperly and actually hurt them by curling over and into their face or head. While this is not common, it can happen. In recent years, photographs of a dead Argali with its horn growing into its face has circulated on social media, sparking rumors about how the animal's own horns can impale and kill it. But just look at the tusks of the babirusa. It would most likely happen slowly over time, putting pressure on the skull. Some commenters on Reddit have said that it looks like the horn was growing into the skull, but then it was killed by a strong impact jarring the tip into something vital. The horn might have become slightly stuck in its face, but that the cause of death was most likely a hunter. The incredible horns of the Marco Polo sheep make them very attractive to hunters, and because they are endangered, you now have to pay around $20,000 to $40,000 for a permit. Large Body Size While it's easy to think that large animals have obvious advantages over smaller ones, evidence shows that this is not necessarily the case. In fact, big animals are more prone
prone to dying out. An estimated 60% of the world's largest animals are threatened with extinction, according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Past examples have shown that survival does not come as easy for big creatures and for several reasons. For instance, super predators of the past sometimes devoured their entire available food supply and went extinct themselves as a result. When prehistoric giants died out in past mass extinctions, smaller creatures then evolved to much larger sizes, thus becoming prime candidates for succumbing to the next mass extinction. For example, after the dinosaurs were wiped out, mammals became the next earthly giants. Climate change also played a role in past instances of size-selective extinctions, as Ed Yong pointed out in a 2016 article for The Atlantic. When temperatures warmed at the end of the last ice age, the landscape changed dramatically. Glaciers melted and forests sprang up, fragmenting previously open habitats. Droughts, changes in rainfall patterns, and other weather anomalies made the environment less habitable. A 2018 study argues that human activity puts larger animals at higher risk of extinction, pointing out the undeniable correlation between the disappearance of megafauna, such as woolly rhinos and mammoths, and the spread of hominids throughout the globe. This phenomenon dates back at least 125,000 years, and some experts even believe it started with our now extinct relative, Homo erectus, as far back as 1.8 million years ago. There are clear connections between megafauna extinctions and the arrival of humans and our close relatives, including Neanderthals and Denisovans, in places previously untouched by hominids. Research shows that the climate changes that encouraged our movement also led to the increased human activity that drove the populations of many large animals down to zero, such as hunting and habitat interference. Much like past megafauna, today's fragile giants like whales and elephants are less likely to survive against our destructive behavior than smaller creatures because of their longer gestation periods and lower reproductive rates and the great amounts of energy it takes to raise their big babies. Honeybee Stingers Most people would agree that being stung by a honeybee hurts, and for those with dangerous allergies, a sting can be fatal. But the exchange is always deadly for honeybees. When a honeybee plunges its double-barbed stinger into someone's skin, it can't remove it. Consequently, it ruptures its abdomen when it pulls away, leaving behind not only the stinger but muscles, nerves, and part of its digestive tract. This is an example of a process called autotomy, which is when an animal defends itself by leaving a body part behind but not all creatures who practice autotomy die from it. This may seem like an evolutionary disadvantage for the honeybee, but they are ready to sacrifice themselves to protect the hive even if it costs them their life. So why do they die when they sting, yet hornets and wasps don't? Some scientists believe that honeybees' nests are attacked more often, making suicidal defense more necessary for them than it is for other stinging creatures. For whatever reason, wasps and hornets can keep their stingers and can even sting repeatedly no problem. Unlike the honeybee, their stinger is not pulled right out of their body. Alligator Snapping Turtle Alligator snapping turtles can measure over 2 feet long and weigh about 250 pounds. It looks quite prehistoric with massive spikes along its carapace and a mean mouth with a bite force of about 1,000 pounds per square inch. There are tales of these turtles snapping broom handles in half, and they can easily snap through bone, so they should never be handled in the wild unless you want to lose a finger. A 15-year-old boy spotted an alligator snapping turtle in a stream near his house. He tried to lift up the turtle and get a picture with it. The turtle snapped his finger right off and then swallowed it. He dropped the turtle in all the commotion and was not able to recover the turtle or his finger before going to the emergency room. He was okay but had to have multiple surgeries and is now missing his index finger. Unfortunately, children are more likely to be bitten by animals and get more severe injuries because they love to touch everything. Giant Freshwater Stingray The giant freshwater stingray may very well qualify as the world's largest freshwater fish. This ancient species, which appears to have changed very little over its several million year existence, is largely a mystery to scientists. Freshwater stingrays are one of the only rays who prefer freshwater environments over saltwater habitats, although it's unknown whether they ever enter the ocean. They are found throughout Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, and Indonesia, where they live and hunt among river bottoms. Freshwater stingrays reach as much as 16 and a half feet long and weigh up to 4,300 pounds. That's bigger than a small car. 
Freshwater stingrays are curious and non-aggressive by nature, and they do not typically attack humans, but they can be very dangerous to people who come into contact with them. At the base of the animal's tail is a sharp barb that can easily pierce human skin and bone, and the creatures are also equipped with a poisonous stinger measuring up to 15 inches long. The barb can get stuck inside and will not only be extremely painful but can also cause a severe infection. Fishers do not target freshwater stingrays because they are not a favored food source, but they sometimes unintentionally capture the animals in their nets or with their hooks. Stories of the creatures dragging boats around and sometimes even pulling them underwater demonstrate the very real dangers of accidentally catching a freshwater stingray. As terrifying as these creatures are, they are classified as endangered. While their numbers are unknown, they are rarely spotted as they are especially susceptible to pollution. Vampire Fish The vampire fish goes by many names. Also known as the payara, wolffish, dracula fish, and dog-toothed tetra, it easily qualifies as one of South America's scariest fish. This predatory species lives in fast-moving waters of the Amazon basin in Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. It reaches between 2 and 3 feet long and can weigh as much as 35 pounds. It is armed with fearsome bottom fangs measuring up to 6 inches long. The fish is even born with holes in its upper jaw, which houses these massive teeth. The largest payara on record measured 3.5 feet long and weighed 39.4 pounds. The carnivorous species, which has no known predators, eats other fish, including the much-feared piranha. These fast-moving, fearsome creatures' bodies are built for speed and for swimming through rough, choppy waters. In addition to being large, powerful, and ferocious-looking, the payara is a highly aggressive hunter. It even chases the fish it is not interested in eating out of the area it wants to hunt in, so that its desired prey will come around. Captive payaras are even meaner than wild ones. They generally cannot share a tank with other fish because they threaten, attack, and kill their tank mates. As a species that is temperamental to begin with, when a payara feels cornered, they become downright fierce. Good news is, while these fish will defend themselves if they feel threatened, they do not seek people out as potential victims. So, while some injuries have been reported, including cuts and bites, it is highly unlikely for a payara to viciously or relentlessly attack someone without cause. Some people even fish for payaras, and when one gets hooked, it puts up a strong fight. The Goonch Catfish The giant devil, or goonch catfish, dwells in deep, fast waters in the rivers of the Indian subcontinent and possibly Southeast Asia. It's one of the largest known catfish species, reaching up to 6.6 .6 feet long and sometimes weighing over 200 pounds. Unlike most other animals, the goonch catfish is known for targeting humans. Between 1998 and 2007, a series of fatal attacks occurred along the banks of the Kali River. In each of the attacks, the creature pulled its victim underwater and dragged them away. The remains of at least two victims were never found, even after extensive and thorough searches of the area. While the credibility of these accounts have been called into question over the years, it is entirely possible, if not likely, that they are all true stories. Extreme angler Jeremy Wade investigated the matter and learned from locals that partially burnt human remains were sometimes discarded into the river in the four to five mile span where all of the attacks happened, possibly leading the goonch catfish in the immediate area to develop a taste for human flesh. Wade ultimately ruled out other possible causes for the attacks, including crocodiles, bull sharks, and whirlpools. The catfish is so big that when it opens its mouth, it creates a vacuum, swallowing people whole. The Arapaima The Arapaima, also known as the Paiche or Piraruku, lives in the rivers, lakes, and swamps of the Amazon basin. These fish can get huge, reaching up to 15 feet long and weighing as much as 440 pounds, according to National Geographic. They also have the fastest known growth rate of any fish, making them an ideal species for farming. But it's not their size that makes them dangerous. They have broad, bony heads, and when they feel threatened, they will use short bursts of speed to hit and attack predators and prey alike. Host of the show River Monsters, Jeremy Wade, had a close brush with death when he was handling an 80-pound arapaima. He said it shot toward him, hitting him squarely in the chest. I don't know if it was making a last bid for freedom or if it was actually aiming for me, Wade remembered. He hit me in the sternum. I could still feel that after six weeks. I was very worried at the time that it might have damaged my heart. However, arapaimas are omnivorous, eating mainly other fish and occasionally eating insects, fruits, and seeds. They breathe oxygen and can feed in areas where other fish are forced to slow down. 
They also have a reputation for hunting fiercely, sometimes charging and jumping out of the water to capture and eat birds, lizards, and small primates. Males who incubate tens of thousands of eggs in their mouth during breeding season become extra aggressive when it comes to protecting their precious cargo. These big fish are also covered with armor-like scales that helps them to resist piranha attacks. The river can be a scary place. Goliath Tigerfish The Goliath Tigerfish is the largest tigerfish species, with the biggest specimen on record measuring nearly 5 feet long and weighing 154 pounds. Many people refer to it as a much larger and deadlier version of the piranha. The species is native to several parts of Africa, including the Congo River Basin, the Lualaba River, Lake Upemba, and Lake Tanganyika. People from these regions claim that the Goliath tigerfish is the only fish that does not fear crocodiles, and sometimes even eats smaller ones. Using its strong force, lightning-fast speed, and 32 jagged, razor-sharp teeth, each measuring up to an inch long to its advantage, chomping down on its prey with surgical precision and little to no warning. On rare occasions, Goliath tigerfish even attack humans, and even when a person wins against one, victory only comes after a tough battle. In October 2010, British angler Jeremy Wade reeled in a Goliath tigerfish, earning him a distinction that only a handful of fishermen are known to have. He captured the specimen in the Congo Basin after an eight-day hunt, using extra care to bring it into his possession. It is a very dangerous fish to handle, said Wade. If you aren't careful, it could easily take your finger off, or worse. Diving Bell Spider Native to freshwater habitats of Europe and Asia, the diving bell spider, also known as the water spider, is the only known spider species that lives almost entirely underwater. It occasionally surfaces to replenish oxygen, but spends virtually the rest of its time resting, hunting, eating, mating, and laying eggs in a submerged environment. The diving bell spider survives by trapping a bubble of air at the water's surface, diving back down, and storing it beneath a canopy made from silk and water plants. Specimens rely on this bubble, simply diving to the surface for another whenever they run low. Diving bell spiders are capable of inflicting a painful bite on humans, accompanied by symptoms like inflammation, vomiting, and fever. Thankfully, these side effects tend to disappear within days and are not known to be fatal or even harmful. The Black Cayman the black caiman is the largest member of the alligator species and the Amazon basin's biggest predator, with adult males growing between 13.1 and 16.4 feet long on average. It's named for its dark coloring, which is thought to efficiently absorb heat and helps to camouflage the nocturnal species while it hunts. Black caimans feed on a varied diet of fish, reptiles, rodents, and even capybaras, which reach up to 4 feet long and they are known to occasionally get aggressive with humans. There were 43 recorded instances of black caimans attacking humans between January 2008 and October 2013. And while less than one-fifth of them were fatal, you just never know. In 2010 in Brazil, a 13-foot-long black caiman drowned an 11-year-old girl by clamping its jaws down on her body and holding her underwater. This tragedy reminded experts of the ever-present threat that these reptiles pose to people who live near them, especially considering their customary hunting tactics which involve attacking prey with virtually no warning of their presence. People who encounter an angry black caiman could easily be injured or killed. A 2011 study admits that scientists do not know the exact threat black caimans pose to humans when the two species live in close proximity to one another, and that victims can die from physical trauma, blood loss, and later infections. Kandiru The Kandiru fish is not necessarily terrifying or even noticeable at first glance, but the species has a reputation for allegedly entering people's urinary tracts and latching itself to the inside using its sharp barbs. According to rumors, the chances of this happening increase if you urinate in the Amazon River. While some Kandiru species reach up to 16 inches long, others are typically much smaller. It's the smaller ones who are known for supposedly invading a person's urethra and painfully torturing them from within, and sometimes even laying eggs inside their bladder. This tale has taken on a life of its own, but is this actually really possible? Stories of Kandiru fish lodging themselves into human urethras began circulating as far back as the 19th century, when European explorers interviewed tribes who said that if one of these fish swam up, the offending member had to be cut off in order to survive. Carl Friedrich Philipp von Martius, the first European to document the Kandiru fish, wrote that men often tied their urethras shut before entering the Amazon River. 
Early accounts claim that the species was even capable of traveling up someone's urine stream to reach and enter their body. Some past quote-unquote expert advice even recommended amputating the penis in cases of the fish invading men's privates, otherwise it would block the whole urinary tract and you would surely die. The first and only known recorded instance of a kandiru being removed from a person's urethra happened in 1997, long after the story gained urban legend status, and even this incident is reportedly questionable. Moreover, the first scientific paper about the kandiru, published in 1930, is allegedly based mostly on hysteria, speculation, and legend. But nobody who wrote professionally about the kandiru ever witnessed such an attack firsthand, calling the credibility of these claims and recommendations into question. A 2001 study even showed that kandirus are more likely to pursue traditional prey such as fish rather than urine-like chemicals like ammonia. I mean, I guess it's better to be safe than sorry, so pee in the Amazon at your own risk. Nile Crocodile The Nile Crocodile, also known as the Common Crocodile, is a crocodilian species native to the freshwater habitats of 26 African countries, living in various freshwater habitats including swamps, lakes, rivers, and marshlands. They are known to be much more aggressive than other species. Adult males grow between 11.5 and 16.4 feet long and weigh from 500 to 1,650 pounds. The largest recorded have measured 20 feet or longer and have weighed as much as 2,400 pounds. Second only to the saltwater crocodile, they take anything they want as prey with the help of their strong bite, sharp teeth, and agile movement. Their bite force may be as high as 5,000 pounds of force per square inch, so there is no way to escape its jaws. They feed mostly on fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals, ambushing their targets after waiting patiently for the perfect moment to attack. The Nile crocodile is widely known as a man-eating species, and this reputation comes with more than a grain of truth. Experts estimate that the species kills hundreds or thousands of people annually, although many, if not most, attacks go unreported. These tragic events stem primarily from the Nile crocodile's tendency to live in close proximity to humans, increasing the likelihood of a hostile encounter between the two. Considering the statistics, it's no wonder the ancient Egyptians both feared and revered the Nile crocodile, which has since become counter-threatened by human activity such as pollution, hunting, and actions resulting in habitat loss. Medieval Dog Collar Dogs have been our best friend for thousands of years. They have been with us through thick and thin as companions, guards, hunters, messengers, and even soldiers. While in the past, dogs might have been considered more working animals than pets, they were highly valued and having a dog during medieval times was considered a symbol of high status. Hunting dogs were bred to hunt specific game and they wore different things depending on what they did. Some medieval dog collars had enormous spikes, ranging from simple leather collars with metal studs and spikes sewn on to elaborate metal collars with intricate designs. This dog collar dates back to the 17th century. Its thick metal and large spikes might look like some sort of torture device, but it was meant to protect the dog's throat from wild animals like wolves and bears. Known as a wolf collar, it was typically used for dogs who served as livestock guardians. This scary-looking device kept the animal's throat and arteries safe from attack, and even sometimes injured the attacker, acting as an effective deterrent against predators. Others were not as dramatic. The Bayou Tapestry, created during the Middle Ages, shows hunting dogs wearing what appear to be slim leather collars. The collars have a ring for a leash, as leash laws go way back to the year 515. Dogs must be restrained by collars and leashes, and any damage caused by a dog not wearing a leash would be the owner's responsibility. Of course, this did not apply to the king or nobility who could hunt with their hounds wherever they please off the leash. Smashed Ancient Beer Mugs Around 1050 AD in what is now Peru, a mountaintop colonial outpost called Cerro Baul held its final party as the Wari Empire collapsed. To mark the occasion, the attending elites trashed the site. First, they destroyed the temple and brewery. Then, in a bizarre grand finale of sorts, they set the brewery on fire and threw their drinking cups into the blaze, then placed their necklaces atop the remaining pile of ash and buried what was left of the building with sand. Wadi leaders had hosted gatherings at Cerro Baul for four centuries before this final night over 950 years ago. During these parties, they were joined by rivals from neighboring Tiwanaku as well as local community heads. The attendees enjoyed lavish cuisine such as llamas, fish, and guinea pigs, 
and drank a beer-like beverage called chicha. Archaeologists believe that these festivities went on well into the Wadi Empire's decline, thanks to the availability of local resources from which to create their brews. Cerro Baul became an important center for diplomacy, where the Wadi readily tried to appease their competition by honoring Tiwanaku gods at some of the site's temples and by inviting their rivals to their drinking parties. The brewery produced hundreds of gallons of chicha at a time, and the drink went bad within days, so it was an excuse to drink it all quickly. There were likely hundreds of people at these gatherings. Donna Nash, co-author of a study on how chicha was made, explained that some batches of the brew may have contained hallucinogens, as evidenced by images of psychedelic plants found on some Wadi pottery. Scientists have a lot more to learn about the Wadi civilization, including why it fell apart and why Cerro Baul was abandoned. But one thing is clear, the outpost remained remarkably resilient throughout the empire's fall, surviving as one of the very last Wadi holdouts until that final night when it was burned down. Metal Hand In late 2018, Swiss archaeologists announced the discovery of a 3,500-year-old metal hand inside a Bronze Age burial, making it the earliest metal body part ever found in Europe. Made from over a pound of bronze, it's slightly smaller than a life-sized human hand. It was equipped with a socket for mounting it on a stick or a pole and had a gold foil cuff over the wrist. Metal detectorists found the metal hand in Bern in 2017, along with a rib bone and a bronze dagger. The treasure hunters turned their finds in to the authorities and led them to the discovery site, where experts proceeded to excavate the heavily damaged grave. We had never seen anything like it, Andrea Scher, head of the Bern Archaeological Service's Ancient History and Roman Archaeology Department, told National Geographic. We weren't sure if it was authentic or not, or even what it was. Radiocarbon dating placed the hand's origins to sometime between 1400 and 1500 BC, during the Middle Bronze Age. The grave it was found in belonged to a middle-aged man and contained a bronze pin, hairpiece, and gold foil fragments. It's rare for Bronze Age graves to contain metal artifacts, and the hand itself is the only object of its kind ever found out of thousands of known burials. Researchers are actively trying to figure out exactly what the hand was used for. Any guesses? Let me know in the comments below! Tolensa Artifacts Around 1200 BC, hundreds of soldiers fought at what's considered Europe's oldest battlefield along the Tolensa River in northern Germany. Archaeologists have been excavating the site for over two decades in search of evidence indicating what may have caused the battle, and who the adversaries even were in the first place. Who was fighting whom? So far, they've unearthed the remains of over 140 of the combatants, numerous bronze objects, and a cache of 31 random artifacts. The quantity of personal equipment and bronze objects suggests that this pile of stuff may have been looted from the dead after the battle and placed in a pile. The collection was found in a sediment deposit near the battle's starting point and consists of numerous bronze fragments and other items, including tools, ornaments, an awl, a chisel and knife, and small cylindrical fittings which were possibly used to hold a bag or a container together. Before then, the fittings had only ever been discovered hundreds of miles away. Finding them so far north indicated to researchers that the conflict's origins were more far-reaching than they previously believed. But nobody can say with certainty where the artifacts originated from, and no clues point toward who owned the assortment of objects, or whether the individual was a warrior or simply a civilian. Experts believe the items are personal objects that belong to someone who was involved in the fighting one way or another, but that's about all they know. Creepy Neolithic Masks over the years, archaeologists have uncovered 16 Neolithic stone masks dating back roughly 9,000 years. The most recently found mask was recovered in 2018 by the Israel Antiquities Authority's Theft Prevention Unit, and according to National Geographic, it reignited past conversations regarding the authenticity of these artifacts. Made from limestone, it bears many similarities to the previously discovered masks, including being the size of a human face, having large eye openings, and holes drilled around the outer edges, suggesting it was meant to be tied around something, perhaps a human face. Omri Barzilai, head of the IAA's Archaeological Research Department, explained in a statement that the masks were created at a time when the region's inhabitants were first settling in organized communities. People started changing from hunting and gathering to agriculture and farming, and during this time there was a sharp increase in ritual and religious activities. 
But the exact purpose of the masks is a mystery. They may have had a ritualistic use, possibly for funerals or worshipping ancestors, or they may have simply been something fun to wear at festivals. Additionally, tracing the masks back to their original sites is difficult, because many of them ended up in private collections before falling into the hands of professionals. For this reason, archaeologists can only speculate on where the masks came from, most likely somewhere throughout the southern Judean desert. Potted Corpses While building a new baseball stadium in Nicaragua's capital city in 2017, construction workers discovered a rare array of 1,000-year-old artifacts that were undisturbed by Spanish conquistadors. Included among them was a large cemetery with human bones, as well as over 30 funerary urns containing human remains. The urns, which date back between 800 and 1350 AD, are helping archaeologists better understand the funerary and burial customs of the little-studied indigenous people who lived in the area before European colonizers came along. By finding and examining these and other artifacts, experts are preventing pre-Columbian cultural identities from being lost entirely. Much of the three indigenous tribes that inhabited the region when the conquistadors arrived in the 16th century were quickly wiped out by disease. Each had its own unique customs and language, but the lifestyle, beliefs, and cultures of these and other Central American civilizations is less known than other, better-studied societies such as the Maya and Inca. Yvonne Miranda Tapia, director of Nicaragua's Institute of Culture, explained in a statement to National Geographic that the urns appear to be from the Chorotega tribe, which spoke the Mangue language and may have migrated south from Mexico. Mysterious Bronze Disc in late 2017, Greece's Division of Underwater Antiquities announced the discovery of numerous new artifacts in a world-famous shipwreck off the island of Antikythera, where the famous Antikythera mechanism was found back in 1901. The newer collection of items included a sarcophagus lid, marble statue pieces, bronze limbs, and a strange disc. They were recovered 180 feet beneath the water surface at the merchant ship's final resting place. The 130-foot-long vessel dates back to the 1st century BC. It was laden with cargo en route to Rome, where the goods would have catered to wealthy residents if they had ever reached their destination. While many of the artifacts appear to be decorative in nature, archaeologists are unsure what the small bronze disc was used for. It contains small holes and bears an image of a bull, and somewhat resembles the Antikythera mechanism, which is also a small bronze disc. It could be anything from an instrument, to a decorative piece, to a special seal. Excavations of the shipwreck are far from complete, meaning that more strange and unexplainable artifacts may turn up in the future. Temple Complex of Brodgar The Ness of Brodgar in Scotland is one of the most impressive archaeological sites that many people don't know about. Located in the Orkney Islands, the site is marked by giant monoliths, the remnants of Neolithic villages, stone mounds called cairns, and a stone circle, or henge, known as the Ring of Brodgar. These mysterious and previously overlooked landmarks have increasingly caught the attention of scholars and tourists alike, who want to learn more about the enigmatic site and the people who once lived and worshipped there. In 2012, archaeologists found the most surprising discovery to date, a large and sophisticated temple complex unlike any other in Western Europe. Until it was excavated, experts were under the impression that the structure was simply a hill, Nick Card of the Orkney Research Center for Archaeology told The Guardian. But, as he further explained, in fact the place is entirely man-made, although it covers more than six acres of land. There are over a dozen temples on the property, which was once surrounded by two giant walls measuring over 328 feet long and 13 feet high. Parts of the site date back as much as 5,000 years. There, archaeologists found elegant pottery, sacrificed cow bones, and other artifacts. Despite these clues, they are not exactly sure what the complex was used for. The Ness of Brodgar's inhabitants arrived around 6,000 years ago and were Britain's first farmers. While it's clear that they implemented spiritual fixtures, their religious beliefs remain largely a mystery. A Cryptic Religion Lake Titicaca straddles the border between Peru and Bolivia high in the Andes Mountains, where it sits at an elevation of 12,507 feet. In 2013, underwater archaeologists recovered a mysterious cache of valuable artifacts from the bottom of the lake, including incense burners, semi-precious stones, ornaments, and gold objects. While it was clear that these items were the prized possessions of whoever dropped them into the lake, what they represented was unknown until relatively recently. 
A paper published in 2019 revealed that the site where the dazzling goods were deposited, known as the Koa Reef, had religious significance for the Tiwanaku people. They were found near a small island in the lake known as the Island of the Sun, which contained numerous sacred sites. The once powerful Tiwanaku state lasted from around 500 AD to 1000 AD, and the objects recovered from the bottom of Lake Titicaca are providing researchers with important insight into the society's religion. Gold medallions and metal plaques found at the site bear images of a deity and of a puma-llama hybrid animal. These and other objects, including llama bones, indicate that the Koa Reef was an important ritualistic site where a tradition of religious sacrifice was established. Relatively little is known about the Tiwanaku in general, although we do know that they like to party with the Wadi. Their belief system is thought to have contributed greatly to their power, but the meanings behind their religion and exactly how it helped the Tiwanaku expand their power are mysteries that experts are still trying to figure out. Codex Washingtonianus The world's third oldest Bible, known as the Codex Washingtonianus, contains exclusive content not seen in other copies, offering rare insight into the history of the First Testament and how early Christians viewed the Gospels. It was purchased by Charles Freer, founder of the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery of Art, where it is occasionally put on public display. This collection of manuscripts came to be known as the Washington Manuscripts after Mr. Freer gave them to the Smithsonian. Originally written in Greek, the parchment book was transcribed in Egypt during the late 4th or early 5th century BC. It's much older than most surviving biblical manuscripts, according to biblical scholar Michael Holmes who told National Geographic that 90% of surviving manuscripts are from the 10th century onward. The book is also one of three surviving complete copies of the Gospels, making it extremely valuable. But the most remarkable thing about the Codex Washingtonianus is the extra passage it contains near the end of the Gospel of Mark that is found in no other biblical manuscript. Identified during the early 20th century, it is known as the Freer Logion. A Logion is a saying attributed to Jesus. It appears to question whether Jesus or Satan truly held more power than the other. This disgruntled some conservative Christians at the time. Holmes explained that no faction of Christianity uses the extra passage in its traditions, and that it was likely an oral speech that was recorded and inserted into that particular copy of the scriptures. The Codex Washingtonianus appears to have been compiled of different texts from various contributors, which could also explain the presence of this uniquely strange passage. It is possible, however, that experts will never truly know the source or reasoning behind it. Thanks for watching! What was your favorite discovery? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you're new here. See you next time! Bye!